Fighting oppression is a bus route, one that may never end. It's not a destination. It's an ongoing struggle that requires new stops to be added and old ones to be removed. A route that is just as mutable as a social construct is. We can all agree on a route that touches all of our stops. We can pool our resources, get a bus and buckle up for the long haul to self-determination and liberation for all people, not just some of the people. On August 19th, the Trump administration forced Planned Parenthood and other providers of the National Program for Birth Control and Reproductive Health Care, also known as Title X, through an unethical gag rule. Planned Parenthood has been in this program across the country since it was created nearly 50 years ago, a bipartisan bill, and have been the largest provider servicing 40% of the 4 million patients who care through Title X health centers. That's more than 1.5 million patients. In Indiana, our Title X clinics see 30% of all Title X patients in the state. Passing a bill with Title X protections is our best hope for fighting this wrong and protecting birth control and other reproductive health care. Stand with me in telling Senator Young, Senator Braun, and Representative Banks that Hoosiers deserve access to birth control. The struggle for justice, equality, and freedom may seem never-ending and hopeless, but we lift our eyes again to that torch. Let each of us here resolve we stand together, today and always, that we demand a halt to militarism and endless war, to xenophobic hatred, to domestic violence against the helpless masses of children and people who just want to live and breathe free. If you stand before us today as a person born in another land, welcome. You are an American. Whether documented or not, you are an American. Don't let them tell you who you are. Plant your feet here. Proudly join us in the battle to make the promise of America real. And let us not blame each other for our small crowds and our failure to finish this task on time. The forces of darkness are strong, but the mighty woman's torch burns everlasting. We will not lower our eyes from the illuminating promise of her great beacon. It's important for us to realize that the number one way we are going to impact change is to get people elected that are going to stand behind us, who are going to stand for our rights, and who are going to pass legislation to protect those who are currently in harm's way. And I know it can be difficult to, it can become a partisan issue of aligning yourself with certain parties. But right now, it's, it's not a party issue. It's, a, it's an issue of whether you stand for women's rights or if you don't stand for women's rights. It's a issue if you believe that police should be account held accountable for killing people of color or if you think that they should be let to, you know, continue working or um, be put on uh, administrative leave with pay. You have immigrants coming here who want to seek better lives for their families and these people are being torn apart. Their families are being torn apart and they're, being, they're still being put in cages. Now, there are people running for city council, there are people running for uh, different positions in our city, and we can stand behind them. The League of Women Voters Fair Map Campaign encourages public participation in drawing the lines to ensure they are fair. The two or more party system just doesn't work. League of Women Voters is participating with ACLU and many others at the state level in the Indiana Coalition for Independent Redistricting. Join the All In For Democracy campaign. Vote. Vote by Tuesday, November.
November 5th. See us for information on absentee voting, early voting options, or you may just go to the polls and we'll tell you how to get there. Again, vote for one, we'll tell you all of that information. You may also go to indianavoters.com. Yes, there's an app for that. Um, and, um, and register there. Experiencing an American nightmare. We need to rise up in all our power and fury. Our presence is required here, now, more than ever before. My words will not be gentle. They will not blow you into a sense of security or rock you into dreams. My words should shake you to your root and enrage you into action. The very earth is screaming for your endeavors of mercy. We are in a revolution of love versus hate and any complacency is aiding the enemy. Right now, the future is watching us. This is a time of villains. This is a time of cowards. And this is a time of heroes. Racism, poverty, and war are the tools of our oppression, setting Americans against Americans, humans against humans, humans against the earth in a fight over crumbs that the property scatter on the ground to keep us from noticing the crimes they are committing against all of us. The powerful elites play word games to weaken our perception of reality. When we hate people, it's called welfare. When we hate banks, billionaires, and corporations, it's called subsidies. When banks, billionaires, and corporations pay off politicians who fix laws in their favor, it's called donations. Each one of the problems we are facing today are intertwined with all the other challenges we are facing. They flourish, nourishing each other like a malignant cancer riding away at the heart of humanity and the soul of our Mother Earth. We don't have money for basic education or universal health care or tax-funded higher education like many other leading countries today. We do have money for wars built on lies, expanded by our country selling arms to death hockey fanatics, we don't have money to house and feed the homeless or convert to green energy, yet we have money for wars cheered on by the press, brainwashing the public into a pathetic, patriotic false pride, enriching weapons manufacturers and oil tycoons. look at the glass half empty. <laughs> Boy, is it half empty. Uh, it's meanness and what emanates from the White House is meanness. And it's interesting just being uh, in the Midwest where there is a real emphasis on being nice uh, and uh, treating each other with politeness and uh, caring for our neighbors. And I see that among you, the way you have embraced people from other countries like the Burmese community that's here. I was told that this is uh, perhaps the largest sent concentration of Burmese uh, immigrants and how wonderfully they have become integrated into this community, uh, the population of Latinos. Uh, certainly we still have the um, the legacy of uh, destruction of the indigenous community uh, that we see here. Um, we have the legacy of slavery that we see here. Um, but we also have the embracing of uh, other communities that is really heartwarming to see. And I think when uh, John from the Center for Nonviolence read that poem that's inscribed in the Statue of Liberty, uh, it gives me chills to think that despite being a nation that was founded on genocide of Native Americans and on slavery, we were at one point in our history a nation that did welcome people coming from other parts of the world. And to say, you know, give us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free, 
Um, wouldn't that be wonderful if that was the sentiment coming from the highest office? And when you see something like the terrible destruction that is happening in the Bahamas, you would think that there would be that welcoming, that open arms. And people trying to come here after that devastation have been turned away by our government. And our government saying we won't even give temporary protective status to people coming from the Bahamas. And it's so political the way we will give temporary protective status to people like coming from Venezuela because the administration is trying to overthrow that government. Uh, but we won't give it to people who are fleeing the legacies of our terrible wars in the 80s in Central America. And that has led to the gang violence that we have actually exported from the United States and has led to the kind of violence that makes it pretty impossible to live in some areas in Central America. But I get to see Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez step into her office in Congress. That is exciting. When I get to see Ilhan Omar questioning people in the hearings and demanding answers because she has the right now to demand those answers, that is really inspiring. When I see Rashida Tlaib getting up and saying, I will not take a trip to Israel with a lobby group called APAC, and I want the right to go to Israel and see my family because we in the United States are giving $3.8 billion a year to Israel, and that should alone earn me the right to get into that country. That is inspiring to see. And when I see Ayanna Presley standing up and doing that same kind of demanding in those hearings that we have rarely seen before, it is exuberant. And when you see them together, known as the squad, uh, they are a phenomenon. And they are inspiring people all over this country and all over the world. When you see the rock star status that these young women have achieved and how threatening they are to the man in the White House, or as Ayanna Presley says, the occupant in the White House, when you see how threatening they are to people who love peace and justice, you know that they are having a tremendous impact. And I also think it's important, no matter where you stand politically, what party you adhere to, or what candidate you like, I think we have to give kudos to Bernie Sanders for having opened up a political space that did not exist before. And I was just talking to some of the young people at your booth there who said exactly that to me, that Bernie Sanders did open the space for a word that was a dirty word before, and that is the word socialism. And the fact that we can talk openly about socialism and that he's asked Bernie Sanders, uh, well, what kind of socialism do you stand for is really uh, groundbreaking. The fact that young people want to hear about a different system, that this is not the end of history as we were once told, that there are other possibilities for a kind of world we can build, and let's talk about those possibilities. It's also so inspiring to see people like Greta Thunberg, the Swedish young woman, who has just ignited the um, sense of possibility among young people, many of whom were feeling a sense of despair. And there is something now that psychologists talk about called climate despair, where young people learn about how bad that things are and think that there is no future. So why should I do anything? And when there is a moment in history when one young woman sets off a spark that really gets people out of that sense of despair and into action, it is so, so, so revelatory of where people are at and how they need that kind of inspiration. And I think we're gonna see it next week when there is the youth climate uh, action happening in New York City and around the country, when there is a climate strike happening around the country and here in Fort Wayne,
Friday at noon on the Martin Luther King Bridge. Yes. It is going to be historic what's going to happen on Friday. And we in D.C. are really excited that on Monday we're participating in something called Shut Down D.C. And we are working not only with environmental groups, but with Black Lives Matter, with Code Pink, with peace groups to show that we all care about our battered mother. We all care about this earth. And we are going to work collectively to say no business as usual. I don't know how many of you raise your hand if you watch the debate. So most of you did. And I think again, no matter if you're a Green Party, Democrats, there might be a Republican in the crowd, you might be no party at all, you might be free, whatever other party. It's important to recognize that the debates are a reflection of the kind of sea change in many of these issues that we have witnessed over the last four years. Medicare for All was considered dead in the water after Obamacare came in. And now suddenly we see not only Bernie Sanders, but Elizabeth Warren, Pete Buttigieg, all these other candidates saying that they too are for Medicare for All. Because you know what? The majority of Americans are now for Medicare for All. And that is reflected then on people who are aspiring for the highest office in our land. Take the race issues. It has been very difficult, even under or particularly under the Obama administration, to have serious conversations about race issues. I see that as having changed in a very, very fundamental way. You had Beto O'Rourke at, uh, uh, at, at the, the, the um, debates the other night talking about, let's not talk about 1776, let's talk about 1619, 400 years ago, when the first slaves were brought to the United States. Let's look at racism as a fundamental issue that has to be dealt with in our country. And you know what? The issue of reparations that was seen as, oh, come on, let's not talk about reparations. This is now a front and center issue. You have people like Sheila Jackson Lee, who is no radical in Congress, that introduced a bill calling for a serious study of what reparations could look like in the United States. And when they had their hearing on reparations, I was in the halls of Congress, and it was just the most exciting thing to see of groups coming in from all over the country who have been working on the issue of reparations, of writers coming in from all over the country have been writing on this issue and saying this is a moment for us to understand that reparations is not a pipe dream, that reparations has to be a reality in this country if we are ever going to get beyond the issue of systemic racism. I see issues around the environment. I talked about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez when she came in and one of the first things she did was join in with the youth of the Sunrise Movement at a protest at the Democratic Speaker's office, Nancy Pelosi, to demand a Green New Deal. And that set off a spark. And people in the halls of Congress understood that there was a movement out there of young people that going down to high school level that are demanding that they pay attention to the future of this planet. And to see something like the Green New Deal that once again was considered something that actually came from the Green Party. And if anybody ever listened to Green Party candidate Jill Stein, or even before her, Howie Hawkins, who is Green Party candidate now, they always talked about a Green New Deal. They always said, Green New Deal is something that is imperative for the survival of the planet. Well, guess what? Then Ocasio, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez took it on. Then other people in Congress have taken it on. Bernie Sanders took it on and gave, I won't say
say meat to the bones, I'll say cave, cave tofu. <laughs> um, and put it in a form of a whole document that actually talks about how this would work, what would have to happen. And so we see politician after politician now wanting to get on the bandwagon, which is a very, very, very cool thing to see. <laughs> issues like a living wage, $15 an hour, that again came from the bottom up with cities after cities passing living wage ordinances so that it became something that they could see, oh, it happened in Seattle and the sky didn't fall. Not only that, the city prospered even more than before they had a living wage ordinance. And so this is something that has filtered up into uh, the halls of Congress as well. And this is precisely what you know how change takes place. Change takes place from the bottom up. It change takes place, takes place when you see groups like Planned Parenthood fighting in their city to demand that they are able to give services for every woman who needs and requires and has the right to those services. And when nobody will rent you a space, what did you do? You bought the building. That is how change takes place. And so we see it filtered from the bottom up.